Hey, Retcon Raider here with a quick and dirty video showcasing the current alpha build for All Walls Must Fall by In Between Games. This is all footage that I recorded for my overview video, but I decided to go ahead and slap some commentary on top of it just to show what the game currently plays like. The devs still have a lot of work to do, but I think the game is pretty enjoyable in its current state. Now, I will be skipping through things like loading screens, but all told, this should be about a solid half hour of gameplay footage, with occasional commentary from me to help explain what's going on at any given time, or to share my thoughts on how certain parts of the game are coming together. Now, as this warning tells us, the game does indeed use an automatic saving system, and it features permadeath and permahurt, but they recently added in options. I haven't really played around with them yet, but if you want a more casual experience, you can apparently fine-tune it in the options screen. Now, there is an overarching storyline for the game, but it's fairly light and vague. They give it to you in small, bite-sized pieces, told in a disjointed fashion, which I suppose makes sense given the secretive nature of the organization you work for and the fact that time travel is a big part of the game's overarching narrative. That fellow who is talking to Kai is, as far as I'm aware, the Faceless, Kai's superior in stasis. He almost certainly has some sort of ulterior motive. Now here we have a pretty good example of the basic dialogue system. Generally speaking, uh, it's interesting, but it's also uh, fairly random and arbitrary. As you play through more and more of the dialogue sequences, you can start guessing at which dialogue options are going to be successful and which ones are going to lead to a fight. But uh, we'll get back to that in the next mission or two. You'll see what I'm talking about. Talking your way past coat checkers can be useful because they generally control the weapon scanners at the front door. All of Kai's weapons are generally going to be picked up by weapon scanners except for his cyber arm, which is a useful weapon, but of course has very low range. So if you can't talk your way past a coat checker, you either have to find another way past the weapon scanner or uh, a secondary entrance to the club or you just have to uh, be willing to fight your way through every guard in the entire nightclub. Speaking of which, here is our target now, so it's time for a bit of combat. Now you'll notice things slowed down a little bit more, and the Faceless is giving me some combat prompts. Things happen one turn at a time, though you are still on a timer. If you look at the bottom right, you'll see that it's counting down every turn to keep me moving. Now I want to avoid attacks, of course. I can see them moving at me in slow motion, all Matrix style. So I need to avoid attacks and pick off my enemies as efficiently as possible. Once a fight is concluded, it rewinds the clock and lets you watch the whole thing out at a faster pace, which is fun, but sometimes a little disorienting, especially in bigger fights. Uh, one notable thing here, though, is that after killing Mueller and his bodyguard, notice that Mueller's dialogue plays out differently. When you first entered the room, he shouts for his bodyguard to kill you, but when it plays back out in real time, he begs you not to kill him. That's, uh... A clever little Easter egg. I didn't notice that the first time I played through. And here we get our first glimpse at the mission selection screen. There's not a whole lot to do here, but we can check out new equipment we can purchase. You start with the undo power unlocked, but you can pick up additional powers like rewind and trace back. Plus, they plan on adding additional powers down the line. With Kai, all of his abilities focus on rewinding time in various ways. 
You can also unlock new weapons, though you'll have to unlock a second and third weapon slot to actually equip them. In this case, I can afford to unlock a weapon slot, but the only weapon I can afford is the shotgun, which I don't really want. So that means my second slot will automatically be filled with a pistol instead. Okay, so here we are on our second mission. Unfortunately, this is rather indicative of the sort of missions that you're generally going to get in the game. They're all fairly simplistic. In this case, we just have to walk around in this club looking for dead drops, which are hidden in ashtrays. Step one is to find our way into the club. As you can see, there's no bouncer this time, but there is a coat check guy. And there is a weapon scanner. I don't really feel like talking to the coat check guy, but I will hack this console, which will allow me to hijack a weaponized drone. There we go, there's our first drone. And I'm going to walk around the club looking for a secondary entrance. Of course, here's the downside to the procedural generation, it looks like. I'm not going to find a secondary exit anytime soon, and you can see that every move is reducing my time gauge. The less time I have, the less I can use my abilities, and the more dangerous combat becomes because of the game's permadeath and perma-injury uh, perma system. Uh, plus, of course, now I've taken so long that enemy reinforcements have started arriving. Generally speaking, the guards that are on site when you first arrive will always talk to you first, demanding to know why you're there, giving you a chance to talk your way past them. But guys like these here, with the exclamation points above their head, those are the reinforcements who are automatically hostile the second they see you. Fortunately, a small group like this can easily be managed by the pistol. The pistol's stunning attack allows you to crowd control small groups like that. And they're done. So that leaves the side exit unguarded. I'll go ahead and hack my way through there which cost me 50 time units. And there's another guard inside. Now I'll admit, this is a little odd. You'd think that because he just heard me gun down two men right outside, he'd already be hostile. But I'm guessing because the door was closed and locked, it uh, keeps him on his dialogue prompt instead. He demands to know what I'm doing, giving me a chance to talk my way past him. Though, in this case, it didn't work, but since it's just one guy, I can easily dispatch him using the pistol stun attack. Alright, so I will continue to progress through the nightclub. You'll notice that every room I discover will further increase my current time gauge. Though, once I start getting to the large rooms, it will very quickly max out my gauge. For the most part, these club goers are scenery, but certain characters, such as the bartenders there, you can talk to, but unless it's part of the uh, current quest objective, they're not really going to have anything to say. They usually just tell you to take a hike, at least for now. I can talk my way past this guy by selecting techno babble options. The dialogue seems semi-randomized, but you can often spot predictable chains. Okay, well, I was going for respected, but I got flirty. Either way, he decided to let me go through, so I can live with that. Though on this particular mission, there's not a whole lot of reason to bother walking through back rooms. That just puts me at risk by forcing me to confront guards. In this particular case, I'm only looking for ashtrays, which, as it states in my uh, instructions, can only be found in hallway rooms. Those will always be outside, uh, connecting the dance room and art gallery sections, where you wouldn't normally see guards. Alright, that's two down, just one more to go. Yeah, 
And there we go. That's all of them. No reason to stick around anymore. Unfortunately, there's generally not going to be any other hidden junk to find. Again, not yet. That may change in later uh, patches as they add more content to the game. So for now, I just need to extract myself. That means going back out to the side exit and walking around to my car. I suppose I could have just shortcutted by walking out through the weapon scanner. At this point, I've killed pretty much everyone. Though I would have to uh, shoot my way past the coat check guy. This is a little painful because you're rewarded at the end of the mission based on completing the mission, the difficulty of the mission, how many people you killed, but also how many time units you have left. So this is killing my reward a little bit. And there we go. 371 time resources as payment. And I can continue on to my third mission. Generally speaking, the missions always appear in the same order. But the contents of the mission are slightly randomized. The layout is randomized. Enemy placement is randomized. The objectives will generally always stay the same, though, as will the brief narrative dialogue openings, so that the story always stays consistent as well. In this case, it's yet another fetch mission, but this fetch mission will take me into back rooms where I'll have to fight my way past guards. You can see some hostile drones passing by. They're essentially like mobile weapon scanners. Unfortunately, in this case, I misgaged things. I thought I could hack the door and slip through before the drone caught me. Which puts me in the middle of a three-way crossfire. Fortunately, drones have a very short range, so you can easily manage them as long as you keep moving. But it's so chaotic, I did take a wound there, which means that I started making use of the undo command since there's no way to currently heal yourself. Though the developer has stated that in the future, he'll be adding in a way to heal between missions. Now this is a fun bit here. I could just switch off to my second pistol and finish off these last two guys easily, but instead I'm trying to draw the enemy drone in front of the coat check guy's fire. There is friendly fire, so you can get enemies to kill each other if you're careful when you're maneuvering around. And there we go. That gives me time to reload my pistol. And since there's only one remaining enemy, I easily dispatch him. But with the coat check guy dead, I can't turn off the weapon scanner. So that means I either have to walk through the weapon scanner, try to get by without setting it off, or just find an alternate entrance. I can, however, take advantage of the Weapon Drone Hacking Terminal. Which means that now I've got reinforcements for any other fights I might get into here. And there's a secondary entrance. No external guard, but generally speaking, you're always going to see at least one guard inside these back rooms. Speaking of which... Okay, now this is a great example of the current limitations on the dialogue system. Your dialogue options are semi-randomized every time you talk to a guard like this, but like I said before, you can quickly start picking out patterns. In this case, I know that I can always bluff my way past guards by identifying myself as a stasis agent, passively threatening them as a suspect in my investigation, and then actively threatening their family in some way. It works every time, making the dialogue minigame somewhat pointless, but I'm sure that's something they'll flesh out in the future.
Okay, now in this case, the dialogue triggered with no options that will lead into a way for me to successfully pass through. I will have to fight these guys unless I wanted to use the undo action to completely re-trigger the dialogue in hopes of getting a better dialogue option. Though again, this does show off one of the game's current limitations. You'll notice that although combat is triggered, it's only actually triggered against that one guy who is talking to me. The rest of these guys are hostile, but they haven't actually spotted me yet. So that gives me ample time to carefully maneuver across the room into a covered position. Though, uh, you'll see my drone is making a beeline right for the one guy who wants to shoot at me. He can't shoot at me yet, though, because he can't actually see me. He has no line of sight. Oop, but now everybody else does. That triggers combat and mass, but now that I'm already in an entrenched position, I can handily pick off the closest guys. This does, however, give us our first real look at some of the destructible terrain system. These tubes are particularly fragile, especially since I'm about to take cover behind this one to get cover from that guy who's flanking me. And it's over, which means I get to watch a real-time replay of the firefight, which I'll admit is pretty satisfying. So that opens up the way to the contraband, and now I just need to find two more deeper in the facility. Don't mind me, citizens, just your average middle-aged cyborg with a weaponized drone in tow, going about his, uh, club business. Ah, this looks promising. Alright, since I can identify myself as a stasis agent, I will just go through the same pattern, once again talking my way past this guy. which means that I can go ahead and grab this contraband as well. Though you will notice that an oddity of the uh, procedurally generated terrain layout here actually prevents me from crossing the room because there's a solid line of obstacles blocking my path. That means I have to walk around the long way. Though I think if I had the cyborg arm active, I could actually punch my way through the terrain. That would just uh, trigger the alarm and immediately start a fight. All right, nothing in here. So the search continues for the final container of contraband. Looks like some enemy reinforcements waiting in there. That means it's time for a matrix style pillar fight. In this case, the dialogue triggers without giving me one of the surefire options to talk my way past these guys, but past experience tells me that I can also talk my way past these guys by convincing them I'm just a uh, maintenance guy. It does, however, require me to guess the name of one of their co-workers. If I had failed to guess the right guy, I could use the undo action to repeatedly try over and over again until I got it right. In this case, I just happened to luck out and get it right the first time around.
Now with this guy, I didn't see any good starting dialogue options, so I just started picking things at random. And hey, it worked. So that gave me a clear uh, shot at the final pack of contraband, meaning it's time to extract. This time, I actually remember that I can get out faster by going through the front entrance. You'll notice the notification there that another batch of reinforcements has arrived. Since the notification came after I had already completed the mission objective, that means they're probably waiting for me out near my car. Now, since I don't care about setting off the alarm at this point, I'm going to risk going through the weapon scanner. You'll notice that, like many things, it only moves when I do. So that lets me carefully weave my way past it. And there's those reinforcements. A single agent, however, is no match for Kai's pistol. So that takes care of that. And another mission done. Now we'll set into my final mission for this play session. Uh, it is essentially another fetch mission. I have to find bombs that have been planted near DJ booths and disarm them. Uh, this is similar to the Ashtray Dead Drop mission, where there are basically decoys scattered around as well, and I have to just keep trying until I find all of the ones that happen to be bombs. This time I decide to try talking my way in. Though, I don't have much luck. Unfortunately, as you can see here, the bouncer, much like the coat check guy, has a different branching dialogue tree. So I really have no idea what I'm doing and I just start guessing randomly. Which he doesn't like. Which leads us to another slight oddity of the current gameplay. Which is that I then proceed to just hack open the door right next to him and he doesn't care. This particular club doesn't have a weapon scanner on the uh, front entrance, so there's no point in talking to the coat check guy. I'll just let myself in and start looking for the bombs on the dance floors. Now, as with the dead drop mission, there's really no reason for me to go into back rooms since I know that my objectives will always be out on the dance floors, which are public areas. But, just for the sake of excitement, I still tend to poke around through every room I come across. No good dialogue options here, so I just punch through it and trigger a fight. When I started the fight, I assumed it was just one guy, but because there were open doors leading into adjacent rooms, I actually quickly find myself in over my head here, as guys start flooding in from the rooms on either side. Fortunately, I hacked that drone, so it keeps people from entering one side of the room while I handle the guys on the other side. But this also gives us a chance to see the destructible terrain system in action again. The guys on the other side have dispatched my drone at this point. And I'm in a bad spot. It's hard to avoid bullets coming from multiple targets at a time. And you'll notice now that when I commit myself to a move that will put me in the path of an attack, a small exclamation point appears. Unfortunately, right here I'm playing on the defensive because my pistol is out of ammo. You might be wondering why I don't just switch off to my second pistol. Well, it turns out that I forgot I had a second pistol. So I just kept dancing around, avoiding bullets while I tried to find a spot to hunker down and reload without taking any injuries. There we go. 
with my pistol reloaded, I can finally shoot back. And that makes the rest of the fight fairly trivial. Once you start stunning people, or whittling down their number, it's much easier to avoid those barrages. And once again, I get to watch a very satisfying reenactment of the battle in real time. Look at Kai gunning all those guys down. What a badass. And, even though I lost my drone, I just happened to walk into a room full of drone hacking terminals. And since I've got almost maximum time units at the moment, I can easily afford to hack all of the drones available. Now that brings us into another relatively tricky fight here, where I once again misgauge things. And no good dialogue options, so I just end up prompting a fight instead. Again, I could use the undo action to rewind dialogue and try to find a peaceful way through. But I kind of like shooting the place up, so... Unfortunately, this is a case where my bloodlust quickly works against me. Because I am in a bad situation. I'm too close to this guy, so the bullets reach me too quickly. Although I'm able to dispatch him efficiently, I take a wound in the process. And since wounds are currently permanent, I rewind my way back to before my victory, so I can try to find a way to finish the fight without taking that flesh wound. But I quickly run into this problem, which is that my drone is blocking my path. Between the drone, the walls, and the destructible terrain, I'm severely limited in where I can move and what I can do making it very difficult to avoid the remaining guards' attacks. This is a case where it would have been much easier to handle if I had unlocked some of Kai's other abilities. One of his abilities, for example, lets you rewind time for Kai himself without affecting the world around him. I could have used that to burst in here, gun those guys down, and then reverse time for Kai to quickly undo the damage he had just taken when he got shot. Or I could have unlocked Kai's other ability, which lets him rewind the world around him without affecting himself. Then I could have just run into the room and rushed to a better cover position. The guards would have been alerted and started shooting at me, but then I could have reversed time, putting them back into their original starting positions, so that when they noticed me, I'd already be undercover, and in a much better position to efficiently dispatch them both. Eventually, I realized my best bet was actually just to walk back out of the room so I could use the walls as cover. Then I shot him from the relative safety of the doorway's bottleneck. Alright, with those guards dispatched, I could go out the side door, but there's no real benefit to it, so I just kept poking around, looking for more dance floors. There's my second drone that I had hacked, better late than never. the drill. I identify myself as a stasis agent, I passively threaten him, and then I actively threaten his family. There's a second batch of guards in the next room, but since I know I'm looking for dance floors, there's really no point in going in there. So I just head in the other direction to explore more of the club. There's a notification that a second set of reinforcements has arrived. I may be in for a bit of a fight once I need to get back to my car. 
speaking of which, it looks like it's time to go. Now this part definitely confused me a little. Hostility started, and it's because of the strange uh, layout and how line of sights are worked out. You'll notice because there are open doors connecting these rooms, these hostile guards were able to spot me from a couple of rooms away. You can actually see the pulsing red indicator where one of the uh, off-screen guards is positioned. That makes it a little easier to figure out where you've been spotted from. I'll admit, these first few missions all had relatively boring objectives, and unfortunately that's the case with about half the missions. There are other missions that push forward the story or involve more uh, reactive objectives. There's one, for example, where you have to go and interview Dragon Mueller, the guy you killed in the first mission. Time travel, right? In that mission, you actually have to walk around and interrogate different NPCs with special dialogue paths. There's another mission where you need to prevent potential uh, double agents from escaping. First, you have to interview them, but once they know that you're there to eliminate them, they all start fleeing en masse, meaning that you need to first scout out the building to tell where they all are, and then plan out the ensuing gunfight carefully so that you can dispatch them all before any of them escape. Now, <laughs> now here's about the point where, as I'm struggling to find a safe place to stand so I can reload, I finally remember that I'm holding a second gun. You can see me trying to remember how to switch over to my second gun. It's the tab button, by the way. Which lets me much more efficiently manage this. You'll notice that right after I stunned that guard, the guy behind him accidentally shot him in the back, killing him. Alright, and that's the last of them, so we'll watch this one last firefight replay, and we'll call this a session. I hope this has given you a better idea of what All Walls Must Fall has to offer in its current alpha state. Like I said in my overview video, I think the game's got a lot of promise, but it's also got a long way to go. The game definitely needs more content if it wants to have staying power. At the moment, it offers some entertainment, but it will quickly become repetitive. I've been playing the game for three, maybe four hours, and I can already often predict what's going to happen based on the game's current limited content. But hopefully that's something that will be addressed in the upcoming content patches. I guess time will tell. At any rate, this is Retcon Raider, signing off. Thanks for watching. Oh, and remember, Although I do love playing All Walls Must Fall, you can find out more about the game by visiting the official website or the crowdfunding campaign over on Kickstarter. Links are in the description.